It is good to be back with you today, church family. Uh, thankful for Carl Bradford for stepping in for me last week. It's good to be back with you. As I open God's word today, I would be remiss if I didn't say a word of thanks to a student in our midst. Um, a couple of months ago, about a month ago, many of you know that my truck was stolen. And as a result of my truck being stolen, the Bible I preach from every week was also stolen. Really disappointing, but there was a student uh, in our student ministry who found out that my Bible had been stolen, and she spent her own money to replace the exact Bible I had. Caitlin Mercer. Can we thank Miss Caitlin for doing that? Really, really sweet gesture. Very thankful to be a part of such a loving congregation like that. Well, we are in gift giving season. It's time to start thinking about what you're going to get those family members for Christmas. It's time to start thinking about what you're going to do for the people in your life that you want to give a gift to. Shelly and I, uh, this past week, made a list and started trying to figure out what we're going to do. But parents, have you had that moment where you spend tons of time praying and thinking? You buy what you think is the perfect gift. And then on Christmas morning by 11 o'clock, they're no longer playing with it. Anybody know what I'm talking about, parents? You've seen that happen. Material gifts are important. And while they are welcomed, they are not as important as spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts and blessings we have are more important because they last forever. The grace and forgiveness we have in Jesus, our, our spiritual gifts, our spiritual church family, all of these things are greater. But what I want to call your attention to as I start this message this morning is that the greatest gift that God gives us is himself. Amen. The greatest gift God gives you and I is himself. All the other spiritual gifts we enjoy pale in comparison to God, and all of the gifts we enjoy actually flow from God's presence. This is important because today Micah is going to continue the theme of judgment. He's going to continue to talk about the judgment of God. Micah was a prophet prophesying during a time of rebellion and disobedience in the nation of Israel and Judah, and his message was meant to call the people to repentance. And we've seen that, how the north did not repent. They were hardened by the message of judgment, but the south humbled themselves and repented and experienced deliverance from the Assyrians. But while Micah has been focusing on judgment, we've also seen glimmers of hope. We've also seen him talk about hope in the king, the hope of the promise that the king is going to come and deliver and restore his people. Micah, in many ways, has these two themes running all the way through it, judgment and hope, salvation and warning. Today he's going to continue the theme of judgment. But in this judgment in chapter 3, we see the critical theme of the presence of God. Now, I want you to know something, that as a Christian, one of the greatest gifts that you've been given is to enjoy God's presence. I believe every Christian, every day, should get to experience the presence of God. Now, to be sure, there are times when God is distant. There are times in discouragement and difficulties where God may feel distant from us. But the truth of the scriptures is that God has never left us nor forsaken us. So the question is, if the normal Christian life is walking in the power and the presence of God, how do you daily experience God's presence? I think the answer is less working yourself up into an emotional frenzy or waiting for that next inspirational song to come on the radio. And it's not even just waiting for the next worship service to come the next week. It actually has to do with how you and I interact with a holy and righteous God. I want to show you today from God's word how you and I can experience the presence of God on a daily basis. This passage in chapter 3, however, starts in the theme of judgment by focusing on the leaders. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This passage starts with judgment of leaders. The passage before starts with God pronouncing his judgment on the leadership community at the time in the nation of Judah. Now in verses 1 through 8, we see two different groups of leaders confronted. On the one hand, we see first in verses 1 through 4, the leaders in government. This is specifically talking about the kings and his officials. Look at verse 1 to see how Micah confronts them. Then I said, now listen, leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, aren't you supposed to know what is just? You hate good and love evil. The judgment that God rendered against the leaders, the kings and his officials of the day, 
is that they had a twisted perspective on the truth. They should have known what was right and wrong. They should have known justice. But instead of embracing the truth, they had actually gotten to the place where they were celebrating evil and attacking what was good. You see, what happens when you reject the truth is you inevitably embrace error. When you reject the truth, you inevitably embrace error. And when you embrace error, you celebrate what's wrong and you attack what's right. We actually saw this just this past week in the Senate in our country as they sought to pass a marriage law that would legalize gay marriage in our country. And we're not against anybody. We don't hate anybody. We love everyone. But we as a church want to advocate for laws that allow people to flourish. When you reject God's design, you inevitably invite harm into your life. What is God's design? God's design is for intimacy, physical intimacy, to happen in the confines of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. And so what's happening in our country is our country... And legislation like that was passed this past week is seeking to celebrate what's wrong and attack what's right. This is what's happening in the passage before us. The leaders of this day were also doing the same thing. They were attacking the truth. They were attacking what was good and holy and just. And they were celebrating what was wrong, what was evil. This twisted perspective on the truth led them to act as if they were cannibals. In fact, there's a very vivid picture that was just read a moment ago. Look at with me in Micah 2 and following. It says, you tear off people's skin. You strip the flesh off their bones. These are speaking of the leaders. You eat the flesh of my people after you strip their skin from them and break their bones. You chop them up like flesh for the cooking pot, like meat in a cauldron. The result is that this twisted perspective led to twisted actions. Instead of serving the people, they used the people. This cannibalistic illustration is meant to reinforce the fact that they were abusing their position of power and authority for their own selfish purposes. What's the result? Look at verse 4. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because of the crimes they have committed. God is unresponsive to their cries for help because they were unresponsive to the cries for help from their own people. This is a dramatic reversal because this language is similar to what we see in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, when the people of Israel are enslaved, the Bible says they cried out and that God heard them and that he saw. He sends Moses and he delivers them now. They're crying out again. Most likely this is referencing Babylonian attack. And God is unresponsive to them. But Micah doesn't stop at just judging the civic and leaders in government positions. He moves on secondly to judging the prophets. This is the second group of leaders that he begins to judge. And we see him introduce that in verse 5. Look there with me in your Bibles. This is what the Lord says concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. Who proclaim peace when they have food to sink their teeth into. But declare war against the one who puts nothing in their mouths. Now the prophets were literally professional truth tellers. They were called to speak the truth no matter what. And as a result, because of their role as professional truth speakers, they were called to lead the people to God. But the prophets have become so corrupt in Micah's day that they were leading the people away from God. Why? The Bible tells us in verses 5 and 6 that they were motivated by money. They would speak one message, a favorable message to someone who paid them, but they would speak against someone who for whatever reason resisted them. What's the result? Look at verse 6 and 7. What is God going to do to them? Therefore it will be night for you without visions. It will grow dark for you without divination. The sun will set on these prophets and the daylight will turn black over them. Then the seers will be ashamed and the diviners disappointed. They will all cover their mouths because there will be no answer from God. God will be silent. Prophets who lived off words from God will be given none. And as a result, they'll be ashamed as if they are fumbling around in the dark. The pattern in these first seven verses of judgment is clear. Leaders abused power 
God will give them no power. Prophets abuse the word, God will give them no word. This is an important ratcheting up of the judgment oracles and declarations in the book of Micah. Because while in chapter 1 he'd been general about the wrath that was coming, and chapter 2 had gotten more specific about the corruption in the nation of Israel and Judah, chapter 3 begins to name names as it were. He begins to get very specific about the disobedience and corruption of his people. The principle that we see play out in chapter 3 then is very simply this. God holds his leaders... To a higher standard. God holds the leaders he puts in positions of authority to a higher standard. If you were to put it just in a principle, in a statement, I would write it this way. And I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. God's leaders must be godly leaders. The leaders of God must be holy, righteous leaders before God. Now, it's important to note that as we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there is a difference. In the Old Testament, leaders were prophets, priests, and kings. The Old Testament, Israel, was a nation ordered around the presence of God. Israel and the church are two different institutions. However, God in his church has put pastors or elders and deacons in places of authority. God's design is the chief shepherd that is Christ, puts under shepherds in his church to lead. We believe every believer needs a meaningful relationship, not only with the chief shepherd, but also with an under shepherd, with somebody in a place of spiritual authority and responsibility that cares for you. The question is, well, what does a godly leader look like? What is somebody who really truly is a leader of character and holiness look like? Look at verse 8 in your Bibles. Micah, contrasting himself from the false prophets of the day, says this. And in this we see a picture of a godly leader. He says, as for me, however, I am filled with power by the spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage to proclaim to Jacob his rebellion and to Israel his sin. What does a godly leader look like? Well, on the one hand, he looks like somebody who's empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's a leader who is controlled by the spirit of God. He knows God and the spirit leads him. But secondly, he's a leader that's controlled and committed to the word. He's controlled by and committed to the word of God. He speaks with authority, not of his own perspective, his own opinions. He speaks the word of God with courage and conviction. Godly leaders in a church are leaders that are led by the spirit and the word. This is a great opportunity just for me to remind you that this is why at this particular juncture in our church's life cycle, we are looking very closely at our leadership structure at First Baptist. We are moving to a plural elder congregationalism where there are a group of men led by the word, led by the spirit, who take spiritual responsibility for the congregation. This is important, church family, because if the leadership community in our church is not healthy, our church will not be healthy. This is critical, but this is one of the driving points that Micah wants to make in chapter 3. That much of the corruption in the nation of Israel, because the leaders were corrupt. Well, the same truth applies in our churches. If our churches aren't led by people of humility and holiness, an entire congregation can be harmed. How many of us in this room could give testimony to watching even in your own life, either in your own life, or maybe somebody you know, being a part of a church where a leader fell or had a moral failure, and it impacted hundreds, if not thousands of people. We believe there's one mediator between God and man, and it's the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is our mediator. But it's important to recognize Jesus does install spiritual leadership in a church for a purpose. So if we're to apply this truth to our lives, let me ask you to do two things based on what we read in the first eight verses. Number one, expect godliness from your leaders. Expect godliness from the leaders of this congregation. We're about to go through a process of installing our first round of elders as a congregation. In the spring, that'll be something you as a congregation will undertake. As we go through that process, church family, let me implore you not to look for charisma, not to look for charm, not to look for somebody who appears to have it all together who has the right things to say, we need to look for men in the position of elder and pastor who have character and holiness in their lives. 
We need to look for men in the position of elder who have the biblical competencies revealed in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. A healthy congregation is not led by charismatic, charming people. They're led by men of character and holiness who put God's word above all else. Church family, we don't need to lead by people that are led by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Expect those kind of leaders in this congregation. But the second application is this. Would you pray for your leaders? Pray for the leaders of this congregation. We have an enemy who is real. And the enemy we have who is real knows that if he can attack and destroy and divide and harm leaders and their families, he can attack congregations. Would you pray that God would protect our leaders? Would you pray that God would protect the families of our leaders? I'm asking you, I'm begging you, would you pray every day for the leaders of this church? Pray that God would move. Pray that God would keep us close and clean. Pray that we would be men of character and of integrity. Micah started with a very specific judgment in chapter 3 about the leaders because he knows that if the leadership is not right, the congregation won't follow. But he doesn't stop at just the leaders and their judgment of the leaders. He moves on to the why. And this is the second point I want you to write now if you're taking notes. Judgment of false belief. The second thing Micah does in this passage is he brings to bear, to bear judgment on the false theology that was behind these leadership failures in the community. Verse 9 and 10, he gives very specific judgment upon what's happening at the nation of Israel as a result of their corruption. Look at with me there in your Bibles, verse 9. Listen to this, leaders of the house of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, you who abhor justice and pervert everything that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with injustice. The judgment here is that the entire leadership community is complicit in the perversion of justice and truth in the nation. The nation of Israel, because of these corrupt leaders, is being built not on the truth of God's word, but on bloodshed and deception. If we were to go back to Jesus' analogy of the two houses, the nation of Israel at this particular juncture is being built on the sand. It's not being built on the rock of God's word. It's being built on something that will ultimately collapse. To drive this point home in verse 11, he even calls names. Look at it with me there in your Bibles. Her leaders issue rulings for a bribe. Her priests teach for payment and her prophets practice divination for silver. The three biblical offices in the Old Testament were prophet, priest, and king. And we ultimately see those three offices fulfilled in Christ. He's the ultimate prophet. He's the ultimate priest. He's the real king. However, in this passage, what... Micah wants to make clear is that these checks and balances that were meant to keep the nation of Israel fulfilling its God-ordained purpose have failed. We have three branches of government, right? Executive, legislative, judicial branches that we separate the powers in our nation to try to have that checks and balances. It was a similar kind of way between these three offices. They were meant to check one another. They were meant to guard against deception. And yet... The entire leadership community and the nation of Judah has been corrupted. And the question is why? How in the world could it happen that this nation that was meant to be a light, a city on a hill, has become so dark? How is it such that this nation that was formed by the redemption of God out of, it, out of, out of Exodus, out of, excuse me, out of Egypt, as he redeemed them out of slavery, how could this incredible miraculous act that formed them now lead them to this place of corruption, the answer is in the second half of verse 11. How did they get to this point? Look at verse 11. Yet they lean on the Lord saying, isn't the Lord among us? No disaster will overtake us. The reason they were corrupted is they believed God's presence gave them a license to sin. They thought We've got God, we've got the temple, we've got all of these things. Nothing bad could ever happen to us. If we were to contemporize this idea, it would be the doctrine in our particular moment of cheap grace. If you ever heard somebody say, well, I, I know this is wrong, but I'm a Christian and I know God's going to forgive me anyway, so no big deal. 
that's what they're doing here. They're saying, we, we know the things we're doing are probably wrong and corrupt and we're abusing our power and our position. But God's among us, so nothing bad's ever going to happen to us. This deception drove their disobedience. The truth of God's word, though, is God's presence and grace doesn't lead us to be free to sin. God's presence and grace in your life gives you freedom from sin. Let me say that again. God's grace doesn't give you a license and a freedom to sin and do whatever you want. God's grace in your life frees you from the enslavement of sin so that you no longer have to sin. That distinction is critically important theologically for your life. Because Jesus doesn't save you to leave you back in your sin. He saves you to free you from that. These people had misunderstood what God's presence in their midst was meant to do. So what's the result? Look at verse 12. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become ruins. And the temple mountain will be a high thicket. The result is they will be removed from God's presence. The people of God were unfaithful to God's law. And as such, they will lose the blessings that God had promised to Abraham. See, when the people were faithful to the law of Moses, they enjoyed land, protection, and a nation. But when they were unfaithful to God's law, they lost their land, their nation, and their protection. And what Micah is predicting is what will happen years from now in this prophecy when the Babylonian army will come in and destroy the nation completely, remove its people, and they'll be removed from God's presence. This is important because the weight of this judgment in verse 12 can only really be seen if you zoom out a little bit to see the big picture. Remember, God's presence is his greatest gift. God's greatest gift is himself. And you see that from the opening pages of the Bible when God puts Adam and Eve in the garden in his presence. The Bible says in the garden of Eden that they walked in the cool of the day with their heavenly father. But when they sinned, when they disobeyed God, when they rejected his authority, when they sought to have his blessing apart from his authority, God, what did he do? He removed them from the garden. He removed them from his presence. Sin brought the wrathful, disciplining presence of God. And while God promised that he would bring a deliverer one day, he would repair what was broken in the garden, they nevertheless were removed. You fast forward to books like Genesis and Exodus, where God establishes the nation of Israel. He begins to reorder a people around his presence. He puts the tabernacle, the temple, where he dwells in a unique way. And the, the people of God are ordered around him. They can only approach God's presence through what? through sacrifice to remind them of their desperate need for the coming Redeemer. Back and forth, back and forth, they disobey, they repent, they disobey, they repent. These Old Testament passages like Micah point to the fact that they're removed from God's presence again in the end. It's as if he's removing them from the Garden of Eden all over again. When they leave the land, when they leave Jerusalem, it's Genesis 1, 2, and 3 being repeated. And so the Old Testament ends with us longing for the presence of God. We're trying to keep the law. We're trying to do these things. Nothing seems to be working. And then at the right time, Jesus Christ enters the world. And he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He perfectly meets the requirements of the law. He's the king we always needed to mediate the blessings of Abraham to us. And now as Jesus dies on the cross and rises again, if we turn from our sin and trust him, we're no longer just a people ordered around the presence of God. We're a people as the church ordered by the presence of God. If you turn from your sin and trust Christ, it's not just that you're given forgiveness and grace. You're given the presence of God, and that can never be taken from you. What this prophecy, this judgment points us to is our desperate need for Christ and his presence. But there's something else. If you take Micah 3 and appropriate it through a New Testament theology, what it also tells us is that the way you and I enjoy the presence of God as believers is through holy obedience. Holy obedience is how you and I enjoy rich, deep 
communion and fellowship with God. Amen. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Enjoy fellowship with God through obedience to God. The way that you and I enjoy real communion and fellowship with our Heavenly Father is through obedience to our Heavenly Father. Now, I want to be really, really clear about what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you and I can earn God's favor and presence. Okay? I am not saying that in our own effort and strength, we can enter the presence of God. No. You and I enter the presence of God based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so you got justification and sanctification. A quick theology review. Justification is the imputed righteousness of Jesus to me. There's an exchange, right? Jesus gets my sin, I get his righteousness. By faith, I'm declared righteous. But what Jesus also does from the point of justification, when you become a Christian, is he begins the process of sanctification, by which through his spirit, he conforms my life to that declaration. My words, my attitudes, my actions through the work of the Spirit conform to the declaration of forgiven, redeemed, adopted sons and daughters of the King. So here's the point. The way that you and I experience the presence of God is by participating in the Spirit's work of wholly conforming us to Christ every single day. Amen. God is everywhere. There is no place you can go where God does not is not present, but though God is everywhere, he has different expressions of his presence in different places. There's the favorable, gracious presence of God, and there's the wrathful, disciplining presence of God. When I was in high school, <clears throat> I wrecked my dad's car. I was trying to show my friends how cool I was, and I took my dad's SUV around a really sharp turn doing about 65. And I slammed the back rear tire against the curb. We were, I don't know why we didn't flip over, just the grace of God protecting us. But from that point forward, every time I drove my dad's car, it did this wee, 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 wee. It squeaked. And so um, being the crafty high school person I was, I tried to find a way to hide it, but there was no way to hide it, right? So there was a moment of reckoning with my father, right? Where I was in his presence, his son... Still uh, the son of Walter Franklin Plumlee. That did not change. But his attitude towards me was not favorable. <laughs> right? Because I tried to act like it was a big deal. And he drove it and he said, son, son no, there, there's something else going on. You did more than just take a curve a little too fast. Right? So I had to own up to that. I had to deal with that. But, but though I was not in the favorable presence of my father, I was in this kind of disciplined presence. It did not change that I was his son. I never stopped being his son, even though there was discipline brought to bear. And there was discipline brought to bear. The same is true for you at a spiritual level. There is nothing you can do to lose your position as a son and a daughter of the king if you know Jesus. Amen. Nothing. There are things you can do to experience the discipline, refining work of God in your life. There are things you can do in your sin that make God seem distant to you. The point of Micah chapter 3 that transcends just this particular moment in Old Testament theology is that the way that you and I truly experience intimacy with God is not just working ourselves up into an emotional frenzy. It's not just coming into worship on Sunday morning and acting like we've got it all together. It is through holy obedience that you truly experience God's presence. You really want to know God's presence in your life? Let me encourage you to do two things in closing. Number one, adopt a posture of dependence. If you want to experience the presence of God through real obedience in your life, live in desperation before God every single day. Let me just remind you, I feel like I say this too often, but I probably don't. I'm probably just about getting it right when I feel like I'm saying it too much. Remember, self-sufficiency is our blind spot today. 
advances in technology and advances in medicine make us think that we are invincible. You are not. You need Jesus as much today as the day you got saved. You need him every day. Be careful about your prayer life being shaped around just gratitude, just requests, rather than starting on your face and saying, God, if you don't move in my life, I can't be the parent you've called me to be. If you don't move in my life, I can't be the student or the son or the daughter you've called me to be. If you don't move in my life, I got nothing. There needs to be a point in every one of our days where we behold our creator and say, you are God and I'm not. And if you don't move in my life, I've got nothing. Parents, a really practical way to do this in your life with your kids is whether you homeschool, public school, private school, whatever you do, make sure you start your day praying and begging God to move in the lives of your family. One of the things we do in the Plumley household is we circle up every morning before our kids go out and we basically just say, God, we need you. We cannot get through this day apart from your presence and power. If you want to experience God's presence, number one, adopt a posture of dependence. But number two, adopt a pattern of repentance. Posture of dependence, pattern of repentance. Part of what you and I need to do if we're really going to live lives of holy obedience is to deal with our sin. To daily turn from our sin and trust Christ. See, the reason dealing with your sin cultivates intimacy with Jesus is because you're treating God as he is when you repent. If I treat my wife like a roommate slash Uber driver, is that going to cultivate intimacy or distance with her? Distance. Good answer, man. I didn't hear enough of the men on that. If, if, on the other hand, I treat her as a gift from God, not just a roommate who I pay bills with, but a treasure that God has entrusted to me that I care for and love and cherish, if I treat her that way, it cultivates intimacy. Why? I'm treating her as she is. I'm according to her the respect and the honor that corresponds to her position in my life. When I live a life of repentance, dealing with my sin, I'm treating God in a way that corresponds to his position in my life. When I ignore my sin, when I compare my sin, oh, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so down the street. There's always Hitler. I can compare myself to him. When I compare it away and don't deal with it for whatever reason, I don't foster intimacy with God. I foster distance. You and I are called to see Micah 3's call on the leaders and their loss of God's presence to live lives of repentance and faith. Remember, repentance and faith is not just how you come to Christ. Repentance and faith are how you grow in Christ. Turning from your sin, that word you spoke to your wife, that disrespectful tone you took to your parents, that way you drove to church this morning, repenting before God and others, owning it, taking responsibility for it, and turning back to Christ over and over and over again is how we experience real intimacy. If God seems distant to you today, I close with this. One of two things is the case. Either one, you are not dealing with your sin. Or two, you don't know Christ. It is possible that there are some of us that have entered this room today who think we know Jesus and we don't. Let me tell you how you can know that. If you never feel conviction, if there is zero change in your life from the point of you coming to Christ till today... There is a really good chance you don't know Jesus Christ. And what I want you to know gloriously and beautifully is that Jesus died to save you from your sin, to, to give you new life, to forgive you of all that you've done and will do. But he did more than that. He also died and rose again to give you his presence.
to give you new life. And if that new life is not showing up in your life, it's a good sign that you don't have it. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, or maybe even as I'm speaking, for the first time a light bulb is going off that you may not know Christ, what we'd invite you to do today is to repent of your sin and trust Christ. You may have been a part of this church for 50 years. I don't care. Humble yourself and know that the presence of Christ is real. I think he calls you to experience. If you need to know more about becoming a Christian, as soon as the service is over, out to my left is our next step corner. We'll have people that are there that love to pray with you, talk with you, answer any questions that you might have. If you're a Christian, we want you to know that our hope is that you'll enjoy the presence of God, walking in obedience before him through a posture of dependence and a pattern of repentance. I want to help you do that now as we close our service with a time of confession, repentance, and assurance. Would you pray with me, please, as we prepare our hearts? As you're there stilling your mind and your heart before the Lord, I just want to remind you as we enter into this time of confession, repentance, that we do this every week in worship. Not just because we're trying to fill up the service with something else, but because we're trying to model for our family corporately what we're seeking to do privately and individually. So right where you are for a moment, I just want you to, to cry out to God, to declare your desperate need for Him. For some of us, that may be something that is very specific. There may be something very specific in your life you're going to cry out to God about, some desperate need that you have. For others of us, it may be something more general, just a general posture of dependence and your confession of need for him. But right where you are in the stillness of this moment, take time just to cry out to God in desperation in your need for him. Heavenly Father, we as a family turn from self-sufficiency, we turn from self-reliance, and we do cry out to you and say we need you, God. Oh God, we need you. We're not strong enough, we're not smart enough, we're not educated enough, we don't have enough technology or medical advances to deal with the weight of the sin brokenness in our lives and in this world. So God, with one voice, with one heart, we declare our need for you and we ask now, God, that by the work of your spirit that you convict our hearts. God, would you point to sin in our lives that we need to repent of and confess to you? Maybe it's a word we've spoken, an attitude we've harbored, anger that we've let fester, something we looked at on our phone or the computer this week. God, we, all of these things and more, God, we ask that right now by your spirit, you would convict us of those things. Church family, as God's spirit convicts your heart, would you confess and turn from those things back to Christ? Father, we confess our lying, our lust, our fear, our anger, sharp words, disrespectful attitudes. God, we confess all these things and more. And Lord, we agree with your word that we deserve the wrath and the justice of your holiness towards our sin. But right now, new and afresh, God, we turn from our sin trust the finished work of Jesus 
we believe that he died in our place. We believe that he victoriously rose from the dead. And we believe that by faith he has saved us from our sins. Lord, would you help us to walk in the peace and the assurance that comes from knowing that there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. We claim the words of John 8 that Jesus spoke to the woman caught in adultery and say that neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more, God. We believe these words. Help us to live our lives in response to that. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things.